Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, October 29, 2019. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. There's a lot on the docket this week, namely the Fed is on deck. So Kabuki Theater really takes place Wednesday afternoon around 2 p.m. when the Federal Reserve or FOMC will come out with their interest rate announcement. It appears that all traders, once again, it happens all the time, it appears that all traders are waiting with bated breath. What's the Fed going to do? Are they going to lower interest rates, raise interest rates? At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. We're focused on a couple of things. We're focused on, in terms of the equity market, where are we on the chart? And did we or will we put in a sign or signal of a trend change? We'll talk about that a little bit more as the video goes on. Maybe that occurred today. We'll get in-depth into that. We'll peel back the onion a little more. Let's stay on what's on the docket this week. We have, I believe on Friday, the phony jobs number. We also have GDP on deck this week. So GDP is scheduled to be released, whatever it is, one morning this week. I can't even remember which one it is. It doesn't matter. I'm not sure the market actually believes, anybody believes we understand what the gross domestic product actually is. Don't misunderstand me. I understand what it's supposed to be. However, I think too many people would question whether anybody can actually track the gross domestic product and how accurate the number coming out of the government could actually be. It's kind of like the phony jobs number. I think there's a margin of error of like 125,000 jobs. Well, if they come out and say we made 162,000 jobs, if the margin of error is 125, the whole thing is a bunch of nonsense. All that being said, we really don't care what the numbers are. We don't care about GDP. We don't care about the phony jobs number. We don't care about whatever the Fed does. What we care about is how the market reacts to any and all data, how the market reacts to whatever is thrown at it. That's all we care about. That being said, let's refocus on the chart. Let's look at the market and take a gander at today's candle. A lot of traders want to call it a topping signal. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Here's the way I'm looking at it. A, the volume once again is very, very light. There's no conviction buying. There's no conviction anything out there. Certainly now leading up to the Fed. We'll probably get some more volume. We'll probably get some conviction after the Fed. But leading up to the Fed... I'm not sure that we can make a federal case out of whatever the chart tells us yesterday and today. Now, let me just qualify that for a second. We are where we are on the chart. Price is always an absolute. Price is never wrong. Only we're wrong. An analyst is wrong. A trader is wrong. A person is wrong. The market is never wrong. The market, by definition, is efficient. Let's get back to the daily chart. And let me explain further why I'm not enthralled with this being a topping signal, a tail candle, a pseudo doji candle, whatever you want to call it. Here's the reason why. Technically, we're pennies away from the all-time high. The market's in an uptrend. Of course, we're extended from home base. What's home base? The 20 period moving average. So therefore, it would not be uncommon for the market to pull back a little bit. Maybe it fills the gap down below. Where's the gap? Right here, the one left open from last week. So the gap is at 301.60. When I discuss the gap, and we're discussing the southern case, right? We're discussing the downside, near-term downside possibilities. This is really designed for pre-Fed for the most part. Post-Fed, you have to be there for inside the numbers because who knows what the market's going to do. We have to be able to read it in real time. So let's do pre-Fed. Let's say the market's selling off Wednesday morning. Where would there be likely, likely garden variety market support? And that would be right around that gap, maybe slightly below. What we're going to do is call it 301. We'll use a horizontal trend line for 301. We replace the 297. We don't need 297 right now. What we do need is 301. Now, the same thing that generally applies will apply. Let's say in this hypothetical scenario, the market is trading lower Wednesday morning, trading lower into that gap. 
if we trade into that gap and quickly back up north away from that gap, that's essentially bullish behavior. We're bouncing off the gap. That's the way I like to look at that. Trading into the gap, not having a robust bounce away from that gap, but digging into it in the southern direction, that's not necessarily bullish. That's more bearish. So we're giving it down to 301. It's a semi round, fat round number, if you will. The safety net below is 300. And also the breakup candle low is slightly below that 299.68. This candle from the 25th. So you can see where under normal garden variety market conditions, there should be a lot of chart support between 301 and maybe slightly below 300 in the SPY. We also don't necessarily need 285 anymore. It was on the chart long enough. 285 worked. Look where we are in relation to 285. Who would have thunk? All right, back in our lane, let's talk a little bit about the north side. We talked about the southern side. Anything more than that will be handled in real time inside the numbers. The northern side, obviously, we made another new high today. There's nothing under the sun that says we can't make another new high or a series of new highs throughout the week. What's the significance of throughout the week? Well, it actually is significant. So not only is it Halloween this week, but also we're in one of those zones later this week where naturally the market could experience a turn. If we're in somewhat of a chop shop throughout the week, it's not necessarily the same if, in fact, for example, we traded up into the end of the week. That might be an interesting scenario. That might be juicy for a turn. Where would we trade up to? That's the tricky part. We don't know. We're at new highs. At new highs, we have to just let it happen. And this is why I always like to emphasize as much as I can here is as good of an opportunity as any. Time is more important than price. I have a time component in my back pocket. I'm looking at a specific day this week. I don't necessarily have a price, but here is a perfect example of I don't really care what the price is if I get the time right. So we'll see how the week unfolds. Time is much more important than price. It's in the course at Lazy E Mini Trader. It's taught in detail. If you don't know it, if you haven't taken it yet, you might want to consider it. Time is more important than price. Not only will it help you become profitable in your trading, it will save you a world of hopium and mystery, no question about it. Let's continue on with the SPY and we'll look at some other charts because I want to emphasize where we are in the charts and what the chart is actually indicating back to us. This is really a continuation from yesterday. We have a move higher, which is essentially like a flagpole. And here's the bull part. So we have the flag part, the pole part, the bull flag part. So this is a continuation. We're basically staying inside of the opening range low from yesterday and today. Today's opening range low was slightly below yesterday's, but yet again, it's still holding. It's a bull flag pattern until and unless it changes. We just go with the duck scenario. If it talks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's likely a duck. At least 80% of the time, it's going to be a duck. How about looking over at the 120-minute chart? Do we see anything different? No, it's just a compressed version of the same thing we just saw. It's a bull flag pattern. If they come down to fill the gap like we discussed before, then it's not a bull flag pattern and something else is developing and inside the numbers members will have a beat on it in real time. We'll discuss it in the video on Wednesday night. Speaking of inside the numbers, here's a snapshot of the commentary from today. Again, it was a very, very quiet day, but we know why. We're quote unquote, this is the air quote thing, quote unquote, we're waiting on the Fed. It's stupid, but you have to play along. It's like a video game. So here's the rest of the morning commentary. We're also going to go over stocks on the move in a moment. There was a couple of interesting ones. I think we can learn something from the charts. So I'm just scrolling around so you can pause the video and you can see exactly what's on the screen. You can read it for yourself. And then you can go back and check what was going on. But we know today was mainly a quiet waiting on the Fed day. 
So we go down to stocks on the move, and we had a little short laundry list of opportunities, only had two hit price targets today. One was Beyond Meat, and the other one was Grubhub. Others came close, but they didn't hit their price objective or entry objective. Unless a stock hits its objective, our objective, we don't want the trade. It has to hit our number. We don't want somebody else's number. Why is that important? It's extremely important, and I'm going to give you the perfect example of Grubhub and what happened today. It's a picture-perfect, teachable moment. So take notice of the numbers that are relevant on the screen. Beyond Meat, 83.76, 81.22. Two entries given. This is all pre-market, meaning the numbers are posted pre-market. The intention is to trade after the opening bell after 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Questions come up all the time. Can they be traded in the pre-market? I see the stocks or I see price bounce off the numbers all the time in the pre-market. The answer is it happens all the time. Whether or not you trade pre-market is up to the trader. I don't like it. The volume is thin. Anything can happen. Something can go down or up two, three, four dollars in a flash. It's great when you're on the correct side of that. Not so great when you're not. Now we'll check out the chart of Beyond Meat. So two price targets were given early in the morning. 83.76, 81.22. Now we take notice of where the stock opened today. 82.95, which is below the first target. What does that mean? That simply means we ignore the first one. If a stock opens below the first one, we just look to the second target as if the first one didn't exist. What does that mean? It means we entered the trade at 81.22. My inbox looked like a party favor. A lot of traders entered the trade down around 81 and a quarter, give or take, and the stock had an immediate rocket ride, making a high of 88.88 just minutes later by 10.30 a.m. Now, nobody's getting all seven and a half dollars out of that, but you get pieces along the way. You take half off, up a buck or two. Next scene shows you're up four or five on another half. It becomes a risk-free trade. By the way, how often do we catch the low of the day or at least the low of the morning? It happens all the time. You know what they call that in Boston? Wicked scary. I stole that from one of the members who sent that down this morning. What about Grubhub? Here's the one with the teachable moment. Three prices were given on Grubhub. 3502, 3386, 3317. Here's what's interesting. There were traders that jumped in Grubhub at the 3502. Let me explain why you shouldn't have. Here's a five minute chart. Now you can see the low in this five minute candle ending at 9.50 a.m. was 3504. The next low, 3506. And that was it. There was one more. That low was 35.10. And then it took off and it made a high of 36 and a quarter and came back down. That's the bounce at minimum we were looking for. I shouldn't say at minimum, but that's a good enough bounce to where the 35.02 would be considered sloppy seconds. So we don't want that price anymore. We have to look to the next entry points. Zooming out a bit again. You can see that if entered at the next entry points and just taking an average of the next two, that's a winning trade. Not the biggest trade on the book, not a Beyond Meat trade from today, but it's a winning trade. Most of the trades are base hits. When we get doubles, triples, and home runs, we just tip our hat and we move on to the next base hit because that's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to make base hits. We just want to hit the ball hard, back up the box. Sometimes we hit a tater. Let's go right back in our lane and we'll check out Camp IWM. So we had a little bit of relative strength in Camp IWM against the SPY. The SPY was basically flat. The IWM was still up about one third of one percent today. That's interesting. Where is it headed? Looks like it's headed to challenge these former highs. That's logical. Looks like common sense. Pretty much, that's what's going on. We also can say that everything's going to be driven after the Kabuki Theater is finished tomorrow afternoon. So, what happens beforehand with the IWM or any of the other markets really isn't going to matter. What's going to happen is how the market settles out post-Fed is going to be certainly more valuable to us. 
No real change in the IWM. We talked about them challenging these old highs yesterday. They're still on their way. How about down at the transportation department? Do we have a canary in the coal mine? Do we have a market that put in somewhat of a pseudo? It's not really one, but we'll call it one for the purposes of this video. It's a hypothetical scenario. Was this a pseudo doji candle? And by the way, it's not really a hypothetical scenario. It is the scenario. But are the transports really leading all of a sudden to the downside? Are they a canary in the coal mine? Putting in a top near 11,000. What was the high yesterday? 10,959 and change. All of a sudden, here we are quite a bit below that. But what we talked about yesterday is the fact that we have one of these breakup candles and it wouldn't be uncommon. It would actually be normal garden variety market behavior to come down and test the low of this candle. 10,658. 10,006, 10,700, somewhere in that neighborhood under normal garden variety market conditions, we would find support down in that neighborhood. If we didn't and they blew right through, something else is developing and there's a pretty good likelihood we already know about it inside the numbers. How about the queues? Similar story down at the transportation department. Also, a little bit of a pullback headed toward that gap. Easy to fill the gap from here. It's really not that far away. The gap in the SPY is a lot farther than the gap in the Qs. Of note, puzzle piece on the table. Still have a big breakup candle. How they dig into that gap or trade right away from that gap in the northern direction is going to be important. So I'm watching closely the Qs, the transports, the SPY. If they're trading down or any or all of them are trading down Wednesday morning, we want to pay attention. We want to pay attention to where they are relative to those gaps and at the time of the Fed announcement and those gaps. It'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds. Will it unfold like a wrinkle-free shirt or will it unfold like a cheap suit? Other than that, there's really nothing else to discuss. We're waiting on the Fed. And by the way, putting this in perspective, there's technically nothing wrong on this chart. This isn't an uptrend above all the moving averages. The moving averages are trending higher. We're far away from home base. That's a problem. Ultimately, they'll want to come back down to check in at home base. What's home base? The 20-period moving average. How are they going to do that? Any number of ways. Could be a drop down to home base. Could be going sideways for a while. Let home base work its way up to price as we eat time off the clock. That's another possibility. It could be a combination of those things. Take notice of home base as we run through different charts. Just put everything in perspective. Pretty far away on the daily chart. Not as far, but still pretty far on the 240-minute chart. Getting closer on the 120-minute chart. Market never really likes to get too far away from home base. 60-minute chart, we're beneath the 20-period moving average. 30-minute chart, well beneath the 20-period moving average. 15-minute chart, you can see same routine. Just a matter of putting everything in perspective. I think the 20-period moving average is important. I think price likes to hug the 20-period moving average. Therefore, I'm watching the 20-period moving average on all time frames, as well as the other moving averages that I follow. I'm watching them on all time frames. Anything important or earth-shattering in the XLF? Not really. It was up a little bit today. It's high on the chart. Is there anything wrong with this ETF or this market? Absolutely not. Does it mean it has to come down? Absolutely not. Doesn't mean anything. Price is where it is. Again, we're waiting on the Fed. There's not much more you can do with that. The SMH certainly can start to make a case for some topping signals in the SMH. Making another new high today, finishing near the low. That's not bullish, that's bearish. 240 minute chart, somewhat of a topping signal, topping tail, topping candle. There's somewhat of a top going on. Is it a coincidence? It happened to be right around 130. The high was 130.16. All of a sudden, we're two bucks lower than that. Big fat round number and a pullback. 120 minute chart, similar, same type of routine. Looks like a topping tail. There's a top going on here. Could a trader be short against that top? What does that mean? The answer is yes. What does that mean? It means if a trader was taking a short position in the SMH 
and you saw a daily close above today's high. What's today's high? 130.16. You close even hourly and daily, obviously, above today's high, and you have to move out of the position. You have to pitch it. It's a cut and run. Here's the weekly chart. Get a different look. All of a sudden, maybe, just maybe, it's too early. It's way too early to tell, but we could be putting in a weekly topping tail depends on where it closes where and when that is where important we don't know yet when we do know it has to be by the end of the week friday's close before then this chart really doesn't matter and by the way just because we may we may not but we may put in a topping signal on the weekly chart look how much downside the smh could have and still stay above the 20 period moving average on the weekly chart it's at 117 that's a long way from where price closed today big sell-off still staying in an uptrend all the way down to 117 about 11 dollars so we could see the smh get whacked about 10 percent and still not miss a beat just want to put it in perspective you have to look at both sides of the tape both sides of the market you want to be the umpire calling balls and strikes with that folks i am going to pull the ripcord here i'm david frost my strategic forecast i certainly do want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in i appreciate each and every one of you without you these videos are not possible i'm david frost my strategic forecast thanks for tuning in for another episode of common sense market analysis